Happy Saturday morning, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch or listen to this edition of Collider Mailbag today. I couldn't be more excited to jump into today's questions because of the person riding shotgun with me over here. Someone I've wanted to get on the show for quite some time. Finally, we figured it out. And Emma Fife is here. Uh, how are you? Emma? I'm great, Roca. Thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, this is great. I like this this bulletin board set up. <laughs> we're like in the back corner of the studio. This is great. Yeah, we're just chilling out. And you know, uh, what's great about the show is we answer questions from the mm -hmm. fans. I know you're big in inter You interact with the fans a lot. I do, and yes. Especially so more so now since you've taken over the Patreon of the Schmodown. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there's a lot of interaction on your end as well. So this, yeah. this will be up your alley, I think. I think so, too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. <laughs> well, you know, it's always great to get questions from you guys. You know, when we put the questions out, we'll put the calls out on social media, on Twitter and on Instagram. We want you to look for that hashtag Collider Mailbag. Submit your question there in your responses. Put the hashtag Collider Mailbag so it makes it easier for me to find if I'm doing a search. Or if you don't like social media, you don't want to be on social media, you can email us, mailbag at collider.com. Send it anytime you want, 2 in the morning, 5 in the afternoon, 3 o'clock at night. I don't care. Send it in, and I read them all to pick the best ones. And I sent some to Emma, and Emma liked the ones that she's chosen so we can all talk about it. So let's get into it. All right. The first one comes from Chelsea McIntyre. They write, hey, Collider crew, I have a question regarding the marketing of Shazam. Why is it that we haven't seen as much advertising compared to something like Captain Marvel or even Detective Pikachu? It looks great. Great, and I personally am really rooting for its success. Why does it seem like it's getting buried? As always, I love all the Collider content. Keep up the great job. Emma. That's an interesting question yeah. because I, I think from my perspective, it, in terms of marketing, there was basically just the one trailer for so long. <laughs> That's true. And I'm so grateful they have a new trailer now yeah. because I have AMC A-list where you can go to the movies three times a week and they play the Shazam trailer before literally every single movie. <laughs> so I've seen that one Shazam trailer a million times. <laughs> Probably not a million, but like probably close to 40 because uh, it's, it's been in theaters since like not long after You're Comic Con. Right. That's a good point. So, but it is, it, it, it does bring up a really interesting point of why is there not as much marketing? Now it's, it's interesting because obviously you have um, with Shazam, Shazam is also Captain Marvel. Mm -hmm. So it's the same character, oh, yeah, you know right. what I mean? So you sort of have like the two Captain Marvels. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, and I mean, and certainly this is a lot in line with things that Zachary Levi has been posting of essentially not, it's not not competing, but being like respecting that they, these are these two separate properties. Mm -hmm. And I think with Shazam there, there was, a little bit of a graciousness of going, hey, you know what? Let's let Captain Marvel have its time. Let's mm. let it really shine, even though you know it is it is a different company. And mm -hmm. I think too, with all of the um, DC properties, you know, Warner Brothers is treading kind of lightly because mm -hmm. it is um, it's it's in a weird sort of murky territory. I yeah. think with Aquaman, it's certainly starting to come back. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the early reviews of Shazam have been fantastic. Yeah. So I'm so looking forward to seeing it. But I, I, and I also think that sometimes when there's not a lot of marketing on a movie, mm. That means the movie's really good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. It certainly can go both ways. Some of them are marketing because they think it's not good. Right. But sometimes it is because they do think it's good. They don't want to give anything away. Yeah. To me, it's always like, how early are they screening the movie for critics? It's a month out. We did our reactions uh, to the first social meetings to Shazam earlier this week. Dennis and I did, and, th and they were mostly positive or almost all positive. So yeah. that lets you know they have a lot of faith in this movie. I think also you got to look at the Aquaman thing, at least Superman, Batman. Those are the well known Wonder Woman, sure. well known characters. So they're going to put more of their marketing budget behind that and who knows how much they spent on Aquaman to get that thing uh, to where it is and look they got a billion over a billion dollars Jeez, out of it so it made sense but with Shazam it's a smaller character not a lot of people know it's kind of a forgotten character mm -hmm. in the DC world and in the Justice League and then you cast someone like Zachary Levi who's not necessarily like someone you go to to see a feature film in so you go put those combinations I think they're just like this is we'll give it a decent amount of marketing we'll see what it does if it catches on great but they have to like figure out where to put their budget in yeah. terms of marketing. No, and I think they decided this wasn't one of those really, big ones. really good point as yeah. well. Because as yeah. you say, not not one of your sort of like top five right. in the DC world, even top ten. Right. That that sort of your average Joe on the street would be able to name in terms of DC superheroes. Mm -hmm. I think. 
It took me months to find a Shazam shirt, <laughs> and now all of a sudden they're around. So, you know. Exactly. All right, what do we got next? All time? right, moving on to question number two. This one comes from Instagram. This is from Jose Grau Jr. writes, with Disney Plus coming soon and the recent success of the Umbrella Academy, could we see Marvel making an X-Men series focused on Professor Xavier's school for gifted children? I love this idea <laughs> uh, for so many reasons. And I know I said on Movie Talk earlier this week, I'd love to see if they come back the X-Men like an older version of the X-Men. That still would allow for this Professor Xavier School for Gifted Children like Netflix series to be around for Disney Plus. Um, that would be incredible. You look at Deadly Class, you look at Umbrella yeah. Academy, the stuff works, you know, and you and if you want to go with mutants that aren't necessarily the name mutants, it doesn't have to be Cyclops or mm -hmm. uh, Jean Grey or Beast or any of the top X-Men. It could be other X-Men like Jubilee that have all that have come around that haven't gotten their fair shake in feature film versions, seeing them be part of a school and work together and do whatever and go, it would still work. I would love to see it. Yeah, I would absolutely love to see yeah. it too, though of course there is that little part of me that's like, mm, I just want this to be exactly X-Men Evolution. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Which that. is basically, <laughs> I mean, obviously that that is your, that's about your big X-Men. That's about right. Cyclops and Jean and Rogue and Nightcrawler um, yeah. and uh, um, Kitty Pride. Like that's, there's so many great characters um, in X-Men Evolution. If you've never watched it, I highly recommend it. Very good animated series. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I think either way, you have such a nice structure there. It's kind of a thing that, that a lot of conversations happen in regards mm. to Harry Potter of, okay, with all this Fantastic Beast stuff, what people liked about Harry Potter was the story about kids going to school. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so they kind of went away from that basic formula. And I think that, that you know, it's the, with X-Men, you have this nice formula in place mm -hmm. to do a school drama, so why don't you? And as you say, it's like you can make the choice. It can be about the characters we know and love, right. or it can be bringing in lesser known characters, or, you know, as you like, specifically mentioned giving Jubilee a freaking moment to be in the spotlight, you guys. I also love that Lana Condor, who, who plays Jubilee, sort of, yeah. in the new movies, is in Deadly Class. Yeah, so, so there you yeah, go. I would love this. It's it's certainly possible, and, and you know, Disney Plus wants to make their name, and I think you see trends that are working yeah. in other streaming services. Why not take a chance to do something like this? And yes, you'd have to cast a Professor X, but sure. it did still work, because look at, look at DC. Totally. They have their TV shows, versus their characters in the movies. And it's, it still the, would work. and it's the same thing of it. It would allow them to potentially make a really interesting, like sci-fi mm. superhero school drama, but people will watch it because of the word X-Men being yeah, attached to it. Exactly, yeah. Yep. So we'll see what happens in the future. All right, let's move on to our next question. And this is a little bit of a minefield. Let's see if we can walk through this thing. <laughs> it's from Instagram. Dennis Stanfield writes, uh, regarding Spielberg, is his displeasure focused in the correct place? Shouldn't he be speaking to the studios? He has leverage with them. They are the ones cutting mid-budget films for blockbusters and well-known IP. Netflix is playing by the rule set as far as the Oscars and giving all directors an easier route to create. A film like Triple Frontier doesn't look like a TV movie. What do you think? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> listen, um, here's the thing is I I have to, I think that, Dennis, you bring up a really good point of his, his focus being in the wrong place. It mm. shouldn't be on Netflix. It should be on the studios yeah, if he yeah. feels so strongly that movies that have a Netflix release shouldn't be shouldn't qualify for awards nominations. Right. Here's the thing though, is that with awards shows, there's all this conversation about, oh, you know, people don't watch the awards show mm -hmm. and their ratings keep going down, which was not the case with the Oscars this year. They were, they were actually up yeah. this year because mm -hmm. um, I think people were just so fascinated to tune in and be like, what's gonna happen <laughs> with no host and all the shenanigans that's been going on? What's this train wreck yeah, I'm gonna watch? Um, yeah. so, I think, though, a lot of the reason for that is because a lot of the films that tend to get nominated for awards don't get a wide release. Yeah. Something like Roma was not, it was in theaters in New York and LA mm -hmm. and other major metropolitan cities. But other than that, you could not go see it in the theater. Right, right. And of course, it did have to have a theatrical run in order to be nominated. But the fact that it was on Netflix, to me, was really cool. Because, mm -hmm. again, you're, you're giving filmmakers this opportunity to have an outlet for their work. I mean, yeah. I mean, another really great example of this is the, um, the, uh, Ted Bundy biopic mm -hmm. oh, that yeah. Zac Efron's going to be in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At, like, after Sundance, Netflix 
put a ton of money into purchasing that. Yeah. So if a studio isn't willing to put forth that kind of money for distribution on something, you can't be mad at the you can't be mad at Netflix for wanting to be able to distribute this to a wide audience. Yeah. It's it's got it's such a, a <laughs> it, it, because this is the thing is I love going to the movies. Yeah. I do. Um but I also recognize that I live in LA where any movie that has a theatrical release, I can probably see it at the AMC across the street. Right, right. Because we have t three AMCs across yeah, the street, by and, the way. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, you, yeah, you can, but the, once you start like getting married, having kids, yeah, you know, responsibilities. It's hard to get it's out. It's hard to go to the movies, so you have to watch them on streaming services. That's why I think a lot of people who do love movies have found a joy in the streaming services because they agree. have access to these films and go to see them when they couldn't normally. And of course, like you said, if you didn't live in New York and LA, it would have been very tough for you to see Roma. You'd have seen yes. a film nominated for Best Picture that you wouldn't even have a chance to go see unless you made extreme amount of effort mm -hmm. to go see them. I was lucky growing up in DC, growing up a close to like a major metropolitan city that would screen films that were of lower uh, knowledge or, or, or IP and they, they wouldn't get out to smaller towns. I was very yeah. lucky in that way. So I, I, you have to understand that other areas of this country or the world don't get access to these things. And so you got to put them on streaming services. Here's the deal with this question. Um, yes, I think Spielberg could have gone to Netflix, could have gone to these studios. There's a reason he didn't, because he wants to work for them in the future and doesn't want to bite the hand that feeds them. Yep. <laughs> Having this kind of uh, approach to it where he's like, well, they should change the rules, change sure, the rules. Sure. It's, doing, it's within his purview and his job to put this out there and have the conversation so studios can look at that and go, I get it, he's working what he's working. If he was to attack the studios, then the studios themselves would be like, well, I don't know if we want to work with this guy in the future. And yes, it's Steven Spielberg, but there's plenty of directors who are up and coming directors who you could give the job to. And yep. so, yeah, so we'll see yeah, we'll in the see. future. This is by no means over uh, with Spielberg and it's Netflix not. and everything like this. So we'll see. What do we have next? Then? Uh, next, we have another question from Instagram. This is from Danilo Judd 11 writes, at what point in your career were you 100% sure this is what you wanted to do for a living? <laughs> and any pointers for fellow filmmakers and cinema dreamers? Well, <laughs> Danilo Judd, <laughs> this is a great question you ask because <laughs> I mean for me personally I fell into what I'm doing now <laughs> yeah. I was an I came out here to be an actor I was uh, struggling and fighting and and uh, working terrible jobs to try to make it as an actor and in the end I, this was something that presented itself to me but as soon as it did I found a home in here and acceptance in this sphere way more than I did on the acting side of things and so for me as soon as some of my shows that I pitched at other networks or other places rather started getting traction or started getting mm -hmm. liked, then I realized this is what I wanted to do. And then when I realized I wanted to do, I realized I wanted to get better at it, so I'd watch other things. So that's what I knew was something that I wanted to do, and I still want to do in certain forms. And as this space keeps changing, because it's mm -hmm. very organic, it's very amorphous, I want to adapt and change within the space, because I enjoy being here talking about films and hearing from fans and having conversations like that. So I would say maybe two years ago, a year or two ago, <laughs> is when I really wanted to do this. And as far as pointers for fellow filmmakers, cinema dreamers, uh, keep loving film and keep finding your way through it and be huh. open to the doors that, that uh, open themselves up to you as you do this. Yeah, I, I think for me it was it, it was sort of a similar journey of I when I had first uh, graduated from college, mm. I toured all around with a children's theater company. Oh, right. I lived yes. out of a suitcase basically for two and a half years. <laughs> uh, and then I decided I wanted to live in one place. Uh, and I liked that the weather was nice in LA. <laughs> and, it was definitely a factor, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but uh, And also, you know, wanted to live in a city where there would be opportunities to work in the arts, sort yeah. of in general. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I Even by the time I moved out here, I went, well, I don't know if I necessarily really want to be an actor, even though my background's in acting. Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of did a bunch of different jobs uh, and hosting... Um, and having discussions about just any sort of media that I was passionate about was something that had always been on my radar. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and I, I kind of fell into uh, doing a couple little hosting things here and there. And then um, I had my, I still to this day, have my job as a tour guide at Universal. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. Which again, you know, that that was such a great gig for me. Mm -hmm. And it, in, because it was the first time in my life in LA. And granted, I had only lived in LA for not even two years by <laughs> the time I got hired at Universal. <laughs> I was very, very lucky. Um, uh, and I was felt very grateful to have this job that was my day job, but that I, I really liked mm -hmm. because 
I got to go hang out at a movie studio every day. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so uh, I then in the midst of doing that, started auditioning for more hosting jobs, had a call back for something and went, man, I really, really like talking about stuff I like on camera. Yeah. Uh, and that was, and that was maybe a year and a half into working at Universal. So I would say sort of end of 2000, sort of mid 2014 was mm -hmm. when I went, all right, this is what I really want to do and pursue. And I knew some of the other tour guides were doing stuff over at After Buzz. And so I reached out over there and Roxy was like, oh, you should, come in sometime. And so it just kind of snowballed yeah. uh, from there. And I, and I think that, you know, my, my biggest piece of advice uh, to anybody that wants to be involved in any sort of content creation, be it in, in filmmaking and doing something like we do and mm. making, you know, how to or explanation videos like Alex does for Star Wars Explained is like mm. basically to just, just keep doing it. Yeah. Uh, and don't, get discouraged and celebrate all of the small victories, whether it be, you know, you get a hundred subscribers on your YouTube channel, or you get invited in to do something at another company because other people saw your work and they liked it there. Yeah. Um, and don't be upset about having a day job to pay the bills. I still work at Universal, you guys. Um, <laughs> uh, I do. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just wanted to um, give credit. There was a really great, um, piece of artwork going around Twitter the other day by uh, at Emmeline Draws uh, that was basically just a graphic depicting, hey, like, here's somebody that works a full-time job and draws at night. Uh, here is somebody that works part-time to pay the bills, but also part-time gets paid to do their art, which is mm -hmm. about where I am. Uh, and then another person that does art full-time, none of them is any less of an artist for not getting paid yeah. to do their art. Great points. Yeah. Great point, Emma. You do, if you love it, you do it because <laughs> you, do it. you love it. Yes. Exactly. Will it get exhausted? Will it get frustrating? Will you wonder, if, why, why am I doing this? Yes, you'll have it. And that's at that point that you have to have the conversation with yourself. Do I love it enough mm -hmm. to keep doing it even if 10 people watch it or five people watch it? That's up to you. And yeah. those are the conversations. Once you're gonna honestly, for me, I walked away from acting and I haven't think, thought twice about on yeah. camera acting because I knew I wasn't as happy doing that as I was doing this. Yeah. Voiceover is a separate conversation. Sure. I still love doing that. Yeah, and but I, the on camera, no. And the other and the final point I want to make about yeah. this is that your is that sometimes your dream evolves. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, because again, when I was a kid, I also grew up acting. Mm -hmm. And I'm at the point now where would I accept an on camera acting job? Of course I would. Sure. I would love to do that. But I also recognized that that wasn't what I really that wasn't necessarily really making me happy. And there were a lot of other things within the arts, within filmmaking, within musical theater when I was in college. This, this started a long time ago for me that I started to realize, you know what? I still like acting. I will always enjoy it, but there's a lot of other things that I wanna do. And it's not giving up on a dream. It is seeing your dream evolve and following that. Yeah, absolutely. Well said, Emma. <laughs> let's, let's move on to our last question. That's from Brian Chung. It's an email. Uh, he writes, Hi, John and the team. With the rise of toxic fan bases and online trolls targeting, targeting specific films to crater, do you think we could see a future where Marvel or even DC springs a surprise movie release on us? Beyonce managed it twice. Nice reference. And Netflix got a lot of attention when they dumped Cloverfield Paradox on us out of the blue. Hiding the production of an entire superhero movie would be a tall order but could the studios maybe just forego announcing a release date and the long traditional media blitz altogether? I'd love to know your thoughts. Emma. I would sort of love for this to happen mm. just because there's, I think that I get so inundated with superhero advertising that that is what is kind of fueling the little bit of superhero fatigue mm. that I have right okay. now. And I think if instead just in the middle of the night. I don't think it would be a cinematic release. Mm -hmm. I think more likely what it would be is a kind of Netflix situation yeah. of a, oh, you know what? Yeah, we did do this super cool, like uh, Charles Xavier School for the Gifted X-Men uh, miniseries and <laughs> Disney Plus, you know, surprise drops it right. after uh, after D23 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to see something like that. Do I think it'll happen? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, but but again, I, I think that in, there's been a little bit of a conversation going on um, in terms of uh, superhero stuff. I, I can't remember. Uh, I saw some people like tweeting back and forth about like, but are you more excited about, you know, Endgame or Star Wars? And 
Uh, and again, they're apples and oranges to me, but I, I believe it was maybe William Bibiani actually that brought up a really good point of, I'm a little bit more excited for Star Wars. And I mm -hmm. thought about myself and I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of that is because I haven't been being beaten over the head with marketing. Yeah. Yeah, but you would have been if Jedi had been incredible, maybe. So it's certainly possible. But, I don't know. But you, you make a good point, and Vince, <laughs> to, to an uh, extent, makes a good point. Maybe it is the Star Wars plan is not to beat you over the head. They yeah. Because they like to keep their stuff quiet yeah. and, and, and keep the details quiet. And it's, quiet. again, going, going back to the Shazam question yeah. of, of if I had not seen that trailer nine million times and again right. that's on amc that is not on right. shazam uh and if i'd gone to a different theater that doesn't play 25 trailers before every movie maybe i wouldn't see it but uh but but there is an air of sort of mystique around it mm. of oh what's this going to be yeah and and which isn't to say like you shouldn't advertise your films but i, I do feel that things can be a little over marketed these yeah. days especially when you have something like the MCU where there is a track record, there is an established, people are going to go see this movie because it is an MCU yeah. film. Yeah, it's a good point. And so when you look at this, yes, would it be incredible to drop something like this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but making an album, way less people yeah, are way involved less. <laughs> than making a movie or a TV series. And not just that, it's location scouting, it's yeah. casting the extras. And then the movie theater itself, if you were gonna do a theatrical release, uh, those employees are not gonna keep quiet mm -hmm. either. They will eventually let it leak or, or yeah. make comments or whatever, even if they sign NDAs. There's all kinds of things that can happen. So unfortunately, I think a theatrical surprise release would be almost out of the realm of possibility. Maybe a TV series, yeah. possibly, but like with Cloverfield Paradox, we knew it had been made. We just didn't know where it was going to show. Yeah. So maybe something like that gets made and then drops way ahead of time, surprises everybody. Yeah. That's a possibility. Sure. So kind of a happy medium of what you're talking about, Brian. But it would be a gutsy decision by any studio that does it and by any streaming service that does it. But it could yield some way more positive dividends down the road. And, that is true. And kind of change the game a little bit, which is what you want to yeah, do to get I, attention. I think that that because I think that the question is incredibly valid yeah. from the oh, standpoint sure. of of all of these people like putting all of these expectations on a film hmm. before they've seen the movie yeah you know coming at it with yeah. like these strong opinions based on a 30 second teaser trailer yeah, yeah, yeah. which again you, you know you're allowed to have opinions but i think there is also a level of needing to recognize maybe i should see the whole thing a perfect example for me okay. is uh battle angel alita uh i loved it mm -hmm. i loved it based on the trailers i did not think i was gonna like it because i was super weirded out by what they did with rosa salazar's face <laughs> but you know what in the whole film it works when you're in the world mm -hmm. of iron city in yeah. that movie it totally works yep so yeah, that's a yeah. great point, Emma. Absolutely, and I would agree. With, I would echo with you as well. I enjoyed the movie not as much as 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 I wanted to enjoy it, sure. but what they did and what Rosa was able to do was incredible. And you're right; the trailer itself maybe didn't sell it too much. You go in there, and you're like, "Oh, I get what this world is," yes. and now it really works for you. And the fact that it made it's already made over 350 million overseas lets that's me know great. that the possibilities <laughs> are open for a sequel. We'll see. Maybe they'll drop that sequel like that without hey! you knowing it. Certainly possible. That'd be kind of dope. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for these incredible questions that you sent in. I tell you this every week, and I mean it every week. It is so difficult to select uh, the ones that, and that don't get selected, to let the ones that don't get selected go, uh, because you guys ask such incredible questions, detailed, nuanced, and sometimes complex questions that we enjoy an uh, answering here on the show. Uh, remember to do it when we put the call-outs on social media, on Twitter, and on Instagram. When you see the Collider Mailbag, hashtag Collider Mailbag call-outs, remember to put your responses there, or email us at mailbag at collider.com. I want to thank Emma Five for taking the time to stop by. Yeah, thank you, Emma. thanks for having me. You are, where, where can people find you and the stuff you're doing? You can find me all over the internet wherever Emma Fife's are sold, at my name, <laughs> Emma Fife. Uh, you can find me over on the Schmodown Patreon basically every single day because I uh, manage it. You can also check me out on the Movie Trivia Schmodown over on the Movie Trivia Schmodown YouTube page. And I have uh, the third volume of He Left It Dead, which is a Call of Cthulhu anthology series Ooh. that I do over at Hyper RPG. is coming back on March 12th. That is this Tuesday. 
Tuesday. It is also my birthday. Uh, that'll oh, be at 7 o'clock p.m. Pacific time, twitch.tv slash hyperrpg. Again, it is a uh, Call of Cthulhu campaign, so it's a live uh, tabletop role-playing uh, campaign. This is the third volume, but it's an anthology series, so you don't have to have seen the other ones to know what's going on, so you should come check it out. It's really <laughs> scary and fun. There you go. All right. Yeah, check that out. That sounds like a lot of fun. All right, thanks, everybody, for watching. You can follow me at the Roke says on Twitter and on Instagram. Really appreciate you taking the time to watch today's Collider Mailbag. And we will see you tomorrow with another Collider Mailbag edition with Hector Navarro joining me on that one. All right, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Talk to you soon.